Thank you, everybody, for, for coming today. We're, I'm really happy to, to see everybody as usual. Um, uh, hope the food is good. Uh, there may be a good bit left over, um, and there are to-go containers out there, so you can, you can take some back with you if you want. Um, I, my name is Kevin Hales. I'm the head of the Triangle Lawyers chapter of the Federalist Society, and I'm an attorney out uh, in RTP for Cisco Systems. Um, the Federalist Society uh, is an organization of over 40,000 lawyers, law students, and scholars, uh, and other individuals who believe and trust that individual citizens can make the best choices for themselves and society. The Triangle Lawyers Chapter is one of numerous local chapters that seek to foster a serious dialogue about issues of individual liberty. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize a few folks we have here today. Uh, we have Judge John Tyson. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we have Judge Phil Berger. Thank you so much. Uh, Judge Bob Numbers and Judge John Carpenter. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and we also have Senator Andy Wells here. Uh, he's running for the Lieutenant Governor. He's done some wonderful work on occupational licensing reform here in North Carolina. And so we're, we're so happy to have you here. Thanks for coming. Uh, all right, today uh, we are delighted to welcome Justin Pearson. Justin is the Florida Office uh, Managing Attorney at the Institute for Justice, which we'll call IJ. Uh, and also oversees IJ's uh, national economic liberty efforts. He's devoted his career to defending the constitutional rights of small business owners. He's argued on their behalf as lead counsel over 100 times in trial and appellate courts across the country. Uh, he often wins types of cases that have never been won before, and as a result, he was honored by the Daily Business Review and Law.com in 2017 for being one of South Florida's most effective lawyers. In addition to litigation, Justin performs a substantial amount of legislative work, including helping his allies and their staff uh, to draft reform bills that have become law. He is frequently invited, as he is here, uh, to testify uh, at legislative committee hearings, and he has done so over a dozen times with occupational licensing reform being the most frequent topic. Uh, he received his law degree with honors from the University of Miami, and he got his bachelor's degree in business management from my alma mater, NC State. Outside of IJ, he's on the steering committee for the Federalist Society uh, Miami Lawyers Chapter, and he's on the James Madison Institute Board of Advisors, and is a member of the American Inter Enterprise Institute's Leadership Network. Thank you so much, Justin, for coming, and welcome. Thank you, Kevin, for that generous introduction. Thank you all for having me. It's an honor to be here. I have one of the greatest jobs in the world. I wake up every day, and I sue the government. It's a lot of fun. I highly recommend it. I am a constitutional lawyer for a nonprofit public interest law firm named the Institute for Justice. What that means is I don't sue for money, and I don't charge my clients anything. My salary and all of our costs are paid for by our over 8,000 individual donors across the nation. Instead, what I do is I go around the entire country providing pro bono representation to small business owners in cases where I ask judges to throw out unconstitutional laws. Uh, I love what I do. Uh, one of the big reasons I went to law school was because I wanted to help out small business owners. My mom is a small business owner. I have other relatives who are small business owners. And so I love the fact that now I get to devote my career to helping out small business owners like my mom. So it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I love it. And, and there's no place better to do it than at IJ. Uh, for those who don't know, IJ is the nation's largest libertarian public interest law firm. Now that's small l libertarian. Uh, we're, we're not associated with any party. We represent people from all backgrounds. And frankly, we sue Republicans almost as much as Democrats. And so uh, we're just philosophically libertarian. And um, we're also growing by the day. We're up to about 130 employees. Uh, spread out among our seven offices around the nation. Uh, as mentioned in my bio, I run our office in Miami, but I litigate all across the US. Um, one of the reasons why IJ has become so large over the years is because we have been uh, tremendously successful. We're getting ready to have our ninth US Supreme Court argument. In the previous eight, we won seven of them. Uh, overall, we win over 70% of our cases, even though we intentionally seek out cases that people say can't be won, and then we find ways to win them. Uh, one reason why we've been so successful at doing that is because IJ made the decision early on to not try to cover all areas of constitutional law. Instead, IJ only focuses on four of them. Those are economic liberty, 
school choice, property rights, and free speech. Today I'm here to talk to you about economic liberty, and specifically, I'm here to talk about occupational licensing, which is fitting because, frankly, it is the biggest issue affecting workers in America today. Uh, it, it, for those who don't know, occupational licensing just refers to a government permission slip to work. Uh, in the 1950s, only one in 20 Americans were required to get a government permission slip to work. That number is now up to over one in four Americans. That makes occupational licensing, uh, ha it gives it a bigger impact than unions, the minimum wage, any other issue you can think of affecting workers combined. Uh, it's not the way things are supposed to work. Uh, occupational licensing was always supposed to be kind of the, the legislative tool of last resort. You know, the last thing you ever want to do is ban people from working. There are many other tools that legislators have at their disposal, but unfortunately now, instead of being the last resort, uh, banning people from working has often become the first resort uh, for many lawmakers. And, and it's so out of control that we're seeing some, some interesting uh, coalitions form. Uh, I don't know how many things the Trump administration and the Obama administration agree on, but this is one of them. In fact, I can think of four things they agree on. And here, I can pull them up. Oops, wrong one. So here are four things the, the, the last two presidential administrations agree on. Um, not only the last two administrations, but you know, uh, free market think tanks, liberal think tanks, libertarian think tanks, people from across the spectrum agree on these points. Uh, there's there's broad-based uh, uh, support for, for everything I'm about to tell you. Number one, occupational licensing laws kill 2.85 million American jobs every year. Here in North Carolina, it's about 43,000. 43,000 jobs lost every year in the Tar Heel State because of occupational licensing laws. Fact number two that everyone agrees on, occupational licensing laws call, cause consumers to be overcharged by over $200 billion, that's billion with a B, dollars every year. Fact number three, occupational licensing leads to increased recidivism. Of course, that makes sense, right? When you take away someone's ability to earn an honest living, it becomes more likely that they will find a different way to support themselves. This one tends to, to blow the minds of my friends on the left. Um, when the researchers who did these studies uh, uh, wrote some columns in, in California news uh, papers talking about how California's licensing laws actually lead to increased recidivism, my friends on the left just couldn't understand um, how, how it could be that their, their progressive politics were leading to increased incarceration rates. It just it never occurred to them that when you make more things a crime, you end up with more criminals. Um, but it's true. Um, and, and fact number four, and this is really the kicker, you know, you might be thinking, oh, well, sure, there are all these costs and problems associated with licensing, but at least it protects health and safety. Wrong. Again, this is undisputed. You'll find this in the Obama White House official report. You'll find this in, in, in research reports on the left and the right. For the overwhelming majority of occupational licenses, licensing laws have no positive impact on health, safety, or quality. It's all bad, no good. You know, you could, and it's easy to see, right, because some states will have one license and, and not others, and other states will have, you know, opposite licenses, but not the ones licensed in the first state. And when you compare states that don't have a license with states that do have a, a specific license, you'll find that there is absolutely no difference uh, between those two states when it comes to any type of consumer protection problem, uh, complaints, lawsuits, you name it. There's no difference. These things, they accomplish nothing. And, and frankly, oftentimes they're not really created to accomplish something that, other than, than banning competition. And so, you know, you see these problems, and it's really a nationwide problem, but, but here, you know, we're in, we're in North Carolina. Uh, I, can, I can list bad examples in every state. This isn't anything about you. Um, but, but I will tell you a few examples of, of some easy places for re reform here in North Carolina. Uh, one, for example, most U.S. states do not have state occupational licenses for uh, opticians. Here in North Carolina, you do. Most US states do not have state uh, occupational licenses for um, uh, sign language interpreters. Here in North Carolina, you do. In, in those states that don't have those other two licenses, um, there are no problems from, from the lack of those licenses at all. But, but here's one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, thanks in large part to, to IJ's work, the majority of US states don't require an occupational license to be a hair braider. Or if they do, they might only require like a 10 or a 15-hour class. Here in North Carolina, 
Your occupational license for hair braiders requires 300 hours of training. That is over twice as long as the requirement to become an emergency medical technician. And it's not that EMTs aren't regulated. They are, and, 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 and they do a great job. The problem is your hair braiding license is insane. Um, and so you could, you could repeal that one or cut it down to a 10-hour class pretty easily. Uh, and, and it would have an immediate impact. Um, you know, uh, IJ, at IJ, we helped uh, Mississippi to get rid of its hair braiding license. After that happened, over 3,000 new jobs were created in a state with a population roughly one-third of North Carolina's. And so you don't need corporate welfare, you don't need handouts, you don't need all these other misguided government programs. If you just reformed occupational licensing, you could create thousands of new jobs overnight. And not just new jobs, but typically new jobs for the people who need them the most, people in, from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, uh, underserved communities, first generation Americans, second generation Americans, all the people that, that, that politicians keep claiming that they're trying to help, all they really need to do is reform these licensing laws and they'll help them more than any other program that the government can come up with. And so, you know, it, it's just, it's really frustrating and, and not just because of all of these problems um, going on, but you know, whenever you have a law, right, whenever you have an enforceable law, ultimately what that means is if you violate that law enough, police officers with guns and badges will show up and arrest you. And that leads to a whole host of other problems. Um, where I live in Florida, I, I live in South Florida, but in Orlando, uh, about a decade ago, full SWAT teams, and I want to repeat this, full SWAT teams raided barber shops on the suspicion of unlicensed barbering. That's a ha you can look it up, it's a true story. And that's not, that's not shocking to people who follow licensing laws. Um, you know, at IJ, our clients have been arrested, uh, sometimes arrested for something as silly as the crime of braiding hair without a license. And, and I'll give you an example. In Texas, we represented a hair braider named Isis Brantley. as She was arrested for the crime of braiding hair. When I say arrested, I mean arrested. Police officers with guns and badges showed up, put her in handcuffs, took her to jail, and, and, and booked her for, for the crime of braiding hair. And she was able to fight back and eventually get that law changed. And then she got in trouble again because she actually wanted to teach people how they could start their own businesses as hair braiders. And she got cited for that, at, w at which point we represented her in a lawsuit that got that, that law ruled unconstitutional. But that's, her, her story is really, really uh, representative of what's going on around the nation. And, and I'd like to show you a short video about her. Um, because one of the things uh, that's super cool about working at IJ, where I work, is not only do we have a, an army of lawyers, but we have great professionals who aren't lawyers who do things like create um, uh, neat videos that explain issues to the public. And so let me show you ISIS's video because I think it's powerful. Seven cops came into my salon and they said I was under arrest and they took me to jail for braiding hair. ISIS Brantley is a professional African hair braider with decades of experience. She opened the Institute of Ancestral Braiding in Dallas and works with everyone from Grammy award-winning artist Erica Badu to the homeless. A lot of these young ladies I found were homeless and jobless. I took them in, I trained them, gave them skills, and now they have become entrepreneurs. In 1997, ISIS was arrested because braiding was a crime in Texas unless you had a special license requiring years of schooling that had nothing to do with braiding. ISIS fought the licensing law for years, and though she won the right to braid, Texas didn't back down completely. Instead of passing braiding laws that make sense, it simply wedged a 35-hour license for braiding into the existing barber statute. Now, ISIS is fighting for the right to teach the next generation of braiders. I've been teaching people to braid hair since 1984, and I want to be able to teach the course at the Institute of Ancestral Braiding. But ISIS can only teach the 35-hour braiding course at an existing barber school. Otherwise, she has to build her own barber school and take expensive and pointless barber classes. The bottom line is that Texas has no problem with ISIS teaching. It just has a problem with her working for herself. To teach braiding for a living in her own school, the government says ISIS must turn it into a 2,000 square foot barber college. And she has to install things that have nothing to do with braiding, like adding 10 barber chairs and five wash stations she'll never use. ISIS also needs useless things like short-haired mannequins and barbering textbooks. Plus, she has to go back to school for 750 hours of barber classes. Braiders aren't barbers, and braiding instructors shouldn't be forced to build barber schools or take classes from barbers. 
That's why ISIS is fighting for her rights once again. She's teaming up with the Institute for Justice to file a federal lawsuit against Texas. This lawsuit means for me economic liberty for my community. And it's important that we change the law so that everybody else can be treated fairly. A victory for ISIS will help braiders and entrepreneurs across Texas and beyond. Economic liberty is especially important for black women. This is our new civil rights movement. So now I'm happy to say that we won ISIS's case, right? So, so the story has a happy ending, but it's insane that she was arrested for the crime of braiding hair. And, and these stories have thankfully uh, attracted attention, and as I mentioned earlier, from both sides of the aisle. So it might make you think that it should be easy to reform these laws. Unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, we've had some modest success getting rid of a license here or a license there, but the typical state has between three and 500 discrete occupational licenses. So those reforms are a drop in the bucket. And, uh, and getting more meaningful reform is extremely difficult, even when you have bipartisan coalitions supporting the reform. And that's surprising to some people, but it, it really um, illustrates what public choice economists refer to as the phenomenon of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. And for those who don't know, public choice uh, economics is often referred to as political science without the romance. It's, uh, it doesn't worry about rhetoric or philosophy or, or you know, what politicians are saying. It uses economic analysis to examine why politicians actually do what they do and why voters actually vote the way they do. And, and what public choice economists have seen over and over again is that you, oftentimes barriers to, real, to reforming really bad policies are created by this phenomenon of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. And what that means is even when you have a, a, a policy that is overall harmful on society, if that harm is spread out among everyone, but then that, that benefit, even that lesser benefit, is concentrated on a small group of people, it's really hard to reform that law because, listen, if you're, if you're annoyed that your haircut costs a couple extra dollars, yeah, sure, that, that's annoying, but it's probably not going to cause you to change how you vote. Right? When you're thinking about you know, ranking what makes you vote for, for the person you vote for, um, you, you've made up your mind long before you get to the cost of your haircut. But if you run a for-profit cosmetology school and someone is trying to take away a law that forces people to attend your school, you are going to scream like your hair is on fire. You are going to galvanize everyone you can think of to try to get that person voted out of office. And so oftentimes, politicians, even politicians who campaign uh, on a platform of helping out small business owners and on deregulation, once they get into office, they will sometimes make the, uh, the business decision to not do something that is going to make it harder for, for them to get reelected. And, and it's, it's a shame to see it, but I, but I see it all over the country in state capitals. You know, there'll be a, a good bill introduced to reform licensing laws, and then when it's going through the committee process, um, different pro-deregulation legislators will introduce amendments to chip away at the bill. And they usually all say the same thing. It's, they'll say something like, don't get me wrong, you all know that I like deregulation, but there are a lot of people from this industry in, in my district and, and, and they like this license, so you just have to get rid of this, the, the reform for this license, you know, keep this license intact, and then I can vote for this bill. And so they amend the bill and they take out you know, the reform for one license. Then someone else stands up and says, now don't get me wrong, you all know that I like deregulation and I campaign on deregulation, but you know, there are a lot of people this, from this other occupation in my district, so we have to take that out of the bill. And by the time the bill makes it out of committee, there's nothing left. And so it's, it's just really tough, it's, it's really frustrating. Um, and it, it's, it's frustrating to, to such a huge degree, it might make you even wonder uh, whether you even have a right to economic liberty. Um, but you do, or at least you were supposed to. Um, in the early days of, of our nation's history, uh, economic liberty was protected by state constitutions. Uh, by the way, just as a side note, uh, state con constitutions are often overlooked by people who are interested in constitutional law and politics. I think that's a mistake. Uh, the majority of my cases on behalf of small business owners are brought under state constitutions, and so I would highly recommend you read your state constitution's Declaration of Rights. I think you'll be uh, surprised and impressed by what you find in there. But anyway, for, 
for the, you know, at the beginning of, of our nation's history, economic liberty was protected oftentimes expressly in, in, in enumerated provisions in state constitutions. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, during the Reconstruction era, uh, there were problems with actually getting relief under those provisions. And you know, to make a long story short, we ended up with the 14th Amendment. Um, and, and the original public meaning, the original, you know, the reason why the 14th Amendment was enacted was in large part because of economic liberty, right? During the Reconstruction era, what were the three worst things that happened um, to, to, to former slaves and their white allies? Well, you know, they, they had the right to vote interfered with, they had the right to possess guns interfered with, and they had the right to earn a living for themselves interfered with. And those were really the three big things that led to the 14th Amendment. So you think, okay, well, that's great. You should be able to bring a, a case under the 14th Amendment to protect economic liberty. It's hard, um, and, and when I think of why it's so hard to bring these cases in federal court, it, it reminds me of, of what the founders used to say about the role of justices and, and the role of judges in our judiciary. Um, as hopefully you know, many of you know, the founders were extremely worried that government likes to grow, that those in power constantly like to expand their power. Uh, Thomas Jefferson famously warned that the, the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground. And so the, the founders tried to come up with every way they could think of to restrict the growth of government, to make sure we had government for the things that we need government for, but then to make it harder and harder for government to expand. But ultimately, at the end of the day, they needed judges to res respect those limitations placed on government. Um, not, not to create policy, you know, not, not, to, not to exercise will rather than judgment, but to be a bulwark of liberty by recognizing that the plain text of the Constitution imposes limits on government. And I think, uh, by the way, if you haven't read Federal 78, I highly recommend it. That talks about that concept at length. But I think my favorite place to look for, for a quote on that concept is something James Madison said when he was presenting the Bill of Rights to Congress, the, his draft of the Bill of Rights to Congress. Madison said that the independent, you know, unelected judiciary would use the Constitution and the Bill of Rights to become, and this is the quote, an impenetrable bulwark against every assumption of power in the legislative or executive, end quote. And so I love that, right? An impenetrable bulwark against every assumption of power. That's wonderful. So you have this, the government over here that we need some of, but always wants to grow and expand. And over here, you've got this impenetrable bulwark that Madison describes that's supposed to keep government in its lane, keep it from going outside of what it's allowed to do. What's the problem with that? Well, of course, the, the problem is judges aren't impenetrable bulwarks. They tend to be very smart, hardworking, wonderful people, but they're human. They're human. Sometimes they make mistakes. Sometimes the government slips one past the goalie and government grows. And, that, and that's the story of the 14th Amendment. Um, I, I know most of you have been to law school, so you probably remember that shortly after the 14th Amendment was ratified, you had the slaughterhouse cases, which, which uh, eviscerated the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Then during the New Deal, you had FDR's fight with the courts which ended up resulting in the Supreme Court deciding that it only liked certain parts of the Constitution and not other parts. Basically, the parts that the Supreme Court still cared about would continue to receive meaningful judicial review under uh, what became known as strict scrutiny. Uh, the parts it didn't care about anymore, which usually involved property rights and economic liberty, ended up being relegated to the intentionally farcical rational basis test. And so when I bring a case under the 14th Amendment in federal court, what that basically means is I need to disprove every hypothetical rationale uh, invented by government lawyers. It, it has nothing to do with a, it has nothing to do with a, a search for the truth that the precedent instructs government lawyers to make things up. And I'm not criticizing the government lawyers. They're doing what the precedent tells them to do. But that's how ridiculous, how watered down the protection for economic liberty has become under the 14th Amendment because judges are not impenetrable law works. And so when, when I bring these cases, and when my colleagues at IJ bring these cases, uh, we really have one of three approaches we can take. Um, the first thing we can do is obviously we can look to see whether the case fits within the part of the Constitution that the Supreme Court still cares about. Um, two of our wins at the US Supreme Court were economic liberty cases. They weren't licensing cases, but they were cases involving small business owners. But those wins were both under the Dormant Commerce Clause because the Commerce Clause is a part of the Constitution that the Supreme Court still cares about. So that's one thing we do. And, and we've won a bunch of cases under uh, First Amendment grounds, um, cases uh, representing tour guides. I had a case in Charlotte uh, not that long ago representing a makeup school teacher who was barred from teaching makeup. Thankfully, after we filed the lawsuit, North Carolina uh, saw the light and, and decided not to fight back. But, but so we have, we've had a bunch of success 
under, under First Amendment cases, um, helping out small business owners. But sometimes, you know, we can't fit the case into a part of the Constitution that the, the Supremes still care about. So we look at state constitutions. You know, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, state constitutions were the first uh, place where economic liberty was protected. And oftentimes, you will find provisions in state constitutions that don't exist in the U.S. Constitution, enumerated protections for economic liberty. And even when the, the, the clauses in the state constitutions are identical to the federal constitution, state supreme courts, as the court of last resort in their state, get to be the final word on their state constitution and can expressly disagree, and often do disagree, with the U.S. Supreme Court. And so you can have an identical provision that in the state constitution protects business owners even more than the federal constitution's precedent does. And so we've brought a ton of cases. Like I said earlier, most of my cases on behalf of small business owners are brought in state court under state constitutions. And so to the extent that anyone wants to, to sue the government on behalf of a small business owner, I would advise read your state declaration of rights and look at your state Supreme Court precedent because you'll find uh, much more help there than you typically will uh, when you look at federal rational basis cases. E even when, um, even when the, the state claims that they're using rational basis review, you'll often find that the precedent itself uh, is more helpful than the, than the federal precedent. But that being said, you know, sometimes there's nothing in the, in the state constitution or the state Supreme Court precedent to, to help. You know, oftentimes, the, the, even though the state Supreme Courts are allowed to disagree with the federal courts and with the U.S. Supreme Court, sometimes that federal rational basis watered down, you know, rubber stamp approach will infect the state precedent as well and it just won't be any better. And so there are times where we'll actually have to bring cases under the 14th Amendment, which is the most difficult thing to do in constitutional law. Uh, it, it, it's so challenging that after the New Deal, 50 years went by without anyone winning an economic liberty rational basis case. When IJ was founded 30 years ago, people told uh, the founders of, of my organization not to bring these cases because you can't win. The rational basis test was intentionally created to make it so that you can't win. It was the Supreme Court taking away rights without having the honesty of admitting that they were taking away rights and, and intentionally creating a, a, a test that was supposed to make it so that the government always wins. But the people at my organization, and this is before I got there, uh, recognized that as long as you have a test, right, as long as the precedent says that there's a test, there must be something that violates that test. And government was so ridiculously out of control, and there were so many outlandish examples of government abuse that my colleagues went around the nation bringing these lawsuits, and you know they'd go to court, and the government lawyer would walk in and say, judge, rational basis test, no real judging is supposed to happen here, brush off the old rubber stamp, and my colleagues would say, well, wait a second, there's a test, the Supreme Court says there's a test, there must be something that violates that test that doesn't pass that test, and this law, this ridiculous law must be that example. And usually my colleagues would lose, but every now and then they would win. And each time they won, it became easier, right? Each time they won, the, the string site grew. And so the, the government lawyers would still say the same thing. They'd still say, hey, judge, rational basis test, government has to win, you know, dust off the old rubber stamp. And, and my colleagues would say, no, you know, sure, it's deferential, right? I mean, my colleagues would always be honest with judges, and I'm always honest with judges. But say, even though it's deferential, sometimes the aspiring entrepreneur wins. Sometimes the business owner wins. And this is one of those times. Um, and so what I'm going to do is, before we open it up for q and I'm going to talk about a line of cases that I think really illustrates both the success and the challenges involved in bringing federal rational basis cases. Um, and these all involve the sales of caskets. Uh, the first one of these cases was a case we brought in Tennessee, a case called Craig Miles versus Giles. And Tennessee's law uh, was very similar to most other states. Basically, it, w when you die, you don't have to be buried if you don't want to be. If you want to be buried, you don't have to be buried in a casket if you don't want to be. If you want to be buried in a casket, it doesn't have to be made out of wood if you don't want it to be. And if you want to actually be buried in a casket made out of wood, you can buy it from anyone you want as long as they're out of state. But if you want to buy a casket from a human being in your own state, you have to buy it from a licensed funeral director even though funeral directors don't build caskets, which are just wooden boxes, and casket builders don't direct funerals. That law existed for one reason and one reason only, and that was because funeral directors made a lot of money serving as middlemen, jacking up prices for caskets on grieving families. And so we brought the case in Tennessee in federal court. 
under the rational basis test, Tennessee came up with every conceivable argument they could think of, which is what the precedent instructs them to try to do. The truth doesn't matter, facts don't matter. Um, that's what the precedent says. And we negated every single rationale they came up with. So then the question became, well, is protectionism itself a legitimate rationale? Is favoring one contingent uh, of citizens over another itself a legitimate rationale? Has a rational basis test been watered down to such a degree that nothing can fail it, that even protectionism itself is rational? Thankfully, the court agreed with us that it's not. Then we went up to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals and we won again. And that was the first time that someone had won this type of case since the New Deal. So we thought, so thought great, oh, by the way, uh, uh, the Supreme Court didn't, didn't grant cert petition, so that was the end of that, and, and our client is, is selling caskets in, in Tennessee right now. Um, so that was great, so then we bring another case, a case in Oklahoma, the exact same case, the exact same law, the exact same facts. We negate every ridiculous argument that the government lawyers creatively come up with, so the case just boils down to whether protectionism itself is a legitimate government interest and we lose. And then it goes up to the 10th Circuit, and we lose on that question again. Um, and it, it, it's so mind-boggling to me that I actually wanna pull up the quote so I don't get it wrong, but here's what the 10th Circuit said, what, what a federal appellate court said in an opinion upholding a protectionist occupational license. This is from the opinion. While baseball may be the national pastime of the citizenry, dishing out special economic benefits to certain in-state industries remains the favored pastime of state and local governments. That's a court ruling against us. That's a court saying, yeah, everything you're saying is true and it doesn't matter. There's no judging to be done here. Doesn't matter how corrupt it is. Doesn't matter how slimy it is. That's the legislature. That's not, that's, we don't get involved as judges because economic liberty is not a right that the Supreme Court cares about anymore. We filed a cert petition. There's a circuit split, right? So the Supreme Court should have been interested, but they weren't, they, they didn't grant it. So we got angry. We pulled out all the stops. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, all the attention we get for our cases, we get bombarded with requests for people to help us. And there was one that we just couldn't pass up, a group that asked for help in Louisiana. Does anyone know who we represented in our Louisiana casket case? First rule of public interest law, whenever possible, represent monks. It's exactly who we represented. One of the groups that asked for our help was a monastery in Louisiana. Uh, they, uh, th their philosophy that they live by instructs them not to ask for charity, but instead to, to earn a living using their hands. And so what they do is, is they take wood from their property and, and they bring it to their little uh, wood shop there at the monastery and they build these simple, noble caskets um, that they sell to acquire money for all the things monks need, you know, food, insurance, robes, whatever. And so um, that's how they, you know, supported themselves. Um, and the state of Louisiana said that if you keep doing it, we're going to arrest you and we're going to throw the monks in jail. And what the state of Louisiana wanted them to do, and I'm not making this up, is they wanted them, they wanted the monks to go get graduate degrees in funeral directing, even though the monks didn't direct funerals, and they wanted the monastery to install an embalming room on monastery property, even though the monks didn't want to embalm anyone. And so we agreed to take the monks case. And let me show you that video really quick before I show you how, before I talk to you about how the case turned out. Well, the monks of St. Joseph Abbey feel very strongly that we have a right uh, to an honest living through the, the building and the sale of our abbey caskets. But Louisiana doesn't respect that right, so the monks have taken the Pelican State to federal court. As monks have done for centuries, the Brothers of St. Joseph Abbey in Covington, Louisiana, put food on their table through the labor of their own hands. Uh, the monks of St. Joseph Abbey have been making caskets for over a hundred years. People who, who ask for them want to share in that uh, noble simplicity that our coffins express. My husband really wanted to have a simple burial. 
He lived life simply and he wanted to have just a simple wooden coffin. And so the monks were able to provide that service for us. But it's a crime in Louisiana to sell a casket unless you're a state licensed funeral director. And the government has launched proceedings to punish Abbot Justin Brown and Deacon Mark Kudrain. For the sin of selling a casket, which is really just a box, the monks face crippling fines and even jail. And they've also lost an important way of supporting themselves. We're not a wealthy monastery and we need uh, the income that St. Joseph Woodworks could generate for the health care and the education of our own monks. The state is going after the monks because licensed funeral directors want the casket market to themselves. There's an unholy alliance in Louisiana between government and the powerful funeral industry lobby. The monks have teamed up with the Institute for Justice in a major federal lawsuit to protect their right and the right of every American to earn an honest living free from economic protectionism and other outrageous government interference. Bureaucrats and special interests are so out of control in this country that not even monks are safe. The brothers of St. Joseph Abbey are ready to go all the way to the Supreme Court if that's what it takes to restore economic liberty to grassroots entrepreneurs everywhere. So th those, are the, those are actually the monks we represented in Louisiana in federal court. And the same thing happened that happened in the other cases that the government as the precedent directs them to do, came up with every ridiculous idea they could think of to justify this unjustifiable law. Uh, eventually, we negated every single one of them. And ultimately, the, the question in front of the court boiled down to whether protectionism, for its own sake, was a legitimate rationale under the rational basis test. We won that case in district court. It goes up to the, the Fifth Circuit, and we win again. And the opinion says, you know, we agree with the, with the Sixth Circuit in the Craig Miles case. Protection is not a legitimate government interest under the rational basis test. The state of Louisiana filed a cert petition. Even though there was a circuit split, the U.S. Supreme Court did not take the case. And so that's where things stand on the casket making front. You know, two circuits say that these laws are unconstitutional. The tenth says that these laws are perfectly fine because protectionism is perfectly fine. Um, but there have been a bunch of other cases, some brought by us, some brought by like-minded organizations around the nation. I'll tell you, the Ninth Circuit has weighed in and said they agree with the Fifth and Sixth Circuits that protectionism is not legitimate. But the Second Circuit has said they agree with the Tenth Circuit that protectionism is legitimate. So we have this ever-deepening circuit split. The U.S. Supreme Court has always refused to take these cases since the split first started getting developed. But I figure one day, hopefully they will. Hopefully my group will be the ones to argue it. We'll see. Um, but I, I mean, I have to tell you, I can't even guarantee that if the Supreme Court takes a case that will win, right? The, the rational basis test is, is so watered down that, you know, we'll have to see. But, but hopefully someday the Supreme Court will take the case and hopefully when they do, we'll win because that's really how we're going to get the widespread reform we need. There, there are many good people fighting, you know, legislatively and we're helping, happy to help out all the great legislators trying to reform these laws. But we really need to take a multi-pronged approach that includes litigation. I don't know how far we're going to get. I don't know if we'll get rid of all the licenses that should be repealed, but you know, I'm just happy that I get to spend my time chipping away at them. You know, one license here and one license there so I can make the world freer for my mom and all of the other small business owners out there. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, sir. All in-state, yeah. If it, if it was a decision between in-state and out-of-state, then we could have brought a dormant commerce clause case. And, and as I mentioned before, we've won two U.S. Supreme Court cases that way on behalf of small business owners, but that wasn't an option in that one. Anyone else? Yes, sir. When, when I talk to my, uh, I guess, friends on the left or the right, a lot of times they'll say, well, surely you can't be against all licensing. I mean, mm -hmm. surely it performs some legitimate purpose. I'm not sure I think it performs any you know, When it's issued by the government, I don't know if it performs any good purpose. But what do you say to those folks? What kind of arguments do you think? 
So first of all, I want to make sure we're starting from the same place, which is understanding the role of government, right? The government does have a role to play, and that role is what we all know of as a police power, you know, health, safety, general welfare. And if something is actually legitimately furthering health and safety, you're not going to see an IJ case, right? Where we get involved is when the government tries to pick winners and losers in the marketplace, which unfortunately is what we typically see with occupational licensing. Um, I share your skepticism that any licensing laws really have a beneficial impact. There's very little evidence supporting the claim that they have a beneficial impact. All the evidence from across the spectrum seems to indicate otherwise. But even if there is some sort of small number of licenses, hypothetically speaking, that should stick around, like maybe if we go back to just one in 20 Americans, like in the 1950s, who were required to have a license, and those were originally it was doctors, then people who had a fiduciary duty like lawyers. If we went back to that, like that would be a huge improvement. We're nowhere near that now. You know, people people still tend to think that like a, a typical license is like a medical license or, or or being admitted to a state bar. No, when you have 500 discrete licenses in your state, only a couple of them are things like that. Most of them are things like hair braiders and boxing timekeepers and dance instructors and musical therapists is a thing now that some states license if you play a guitar to kids in the hospital. Like it, those are the typical licenses, not doctors and lawyers. And so I hope, I hope we someday get to the point where we're having a debate over where to draw that line because we're nowhere near it right now. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I'm not uh, familiar with the licensing case on that, although we have had cases that relate to price setting and different things. What other state constitution language are you seeing that's kind of right for picking on this issue? So it depends on the state constitution. Different state constitutions are different. Uh, but here in North Carolina, I am familiar with the, with the fruits of your own labor clause. I know that's that's uh, argued in a case. It's not a case I'm bringing, but my colleagues have a challenge to a certificate of need requirement going on that at least in part relies on that clause. And so sometimes we'll see kind of uh, discrete provisions in the state constitution that doesn't exist in the federal constitutions. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's a great example. I've won cases in other states under state constitutional anti-monopoly clauses. About a dozen states have those. We'll also see uh, state constitutional provisions against special laws, um, which sometimes can be useful. And then, you know, we always have to remember that even when it comes to things that also exist in the U.S. Constitution, like due process, due process and equal protection, oftentimes the state Supreme Court precedent uh, analyzing their, their state constitution will allow it to be more protect, protective than the current federal precedent. So you just you really have to do a deep dive into both the precedent in addition to the clauses themselves. But I, I know that the, the, the protection of the fruits of one's own labor is a good one. Yes, sir. I would love to say yes, but um, no, it, it, we're, we're a, a, long, far, a long way from there. So they, they prefer the irrational basis. That is correct. They prefer, they, they prefer this judicially created doctrine created in the New Deal, during the New Deal that says really government has, uh, judges have no role to play here. It, even though any le legitimate analysis of the 14th Amendment or many of these state constitutional provisions will recognize that economic liberty was protected by the original public meaning. And, that, and that's the whole point. It's not that judges should just do whatever I want them to do. There are all sorts of provisions, like say the 16th and 17th Amendment, that I think were bad ideas. But if there's a case in front of a judge, they need to follow what the text says. They need to follow the original public meaning of that language. And so I'm not saying judges can just do whatever they want. That's the opposite of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is judges need to be engaged. They need to look at the actual text, the actual original public meaning, and the actual evidence. And it turns out that when you're talking about economic liberty, that was the reason, that was one of the reasons for the 14th Amendment, as well as many of these state provisions. And it's a shame that, that they're not receiving the respect they deserve. Maybe someday. Um, you know, you have to have. Well, no. I mean, you know, what's the famous quote that that, that property rights are the tangible expression of individual liberty? Um, you know, I mentioned early on that we're getting ready to have our ninth U.S. Supreme Court case, and of our previous eight, we we won seven. The one we lost was the infamous Kilo versus New London eminent domain case. We represented Suzette Kilo in her battle to protect her little pink house. 
And that, like, that's the only case we've ever lost at the Supreme Court. So, you know, as with economic liberty, property rights, and really some people even consider economic liberty to be a subset of property rights. It, it's just, it's a shame that, you know, not, not for our entire nation's history, but going back until around the 1930s, until now, we've got 80 years of precedent now saying property rights and economic liberty just don't matter to the judges, and, and that's a shame. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll see. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I believe so. I know we were involved. We've been involved in quite a few teeth whitening cases, and I think that was one of them. I was I wasn't the lawyer on that one, but I, but if memory serves, we were. I should know the answer to that, and unfortunately, I don't remember that one specifically. Um, we've had we, teeth whitening has been a tough one for us. Um, we've that's one where we've probably lost more than we've won. Um, which is a shame, right? Because teeth whitening is the type of thing that people can do it themselves, right? And it's not a problem if you do it yourself, but if you have someone give you a little bit of guidance, now all of a sudden that person's committed a crime. It's ridiculous. But just because it has to do with teeth and, I don't know, it seems to, it seems to give some judges the, the heebie-jeebies, so we've had difficulty with that one. I, I, don't, I don't specifically remember the North Carolina one. I'm sorry, I should. Uh, there was another hand back there. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, I mean, under the rational basis test, that's really, those are really opposite sides of the same coin, right? I mean, in a perfect world, there would be multiple ways to, to, to win an economic liberty challenge under the federal constitution without having to show that the, the law is wholly arbitrary. But under the rational basis test, the arbitrariness is, is part of it. It's actually part, if you actually read the, the entire description of the rational basis test, you know, you have to show that the law is arbitrary. So in order for us to win, we have to show the law is wholly arbitrary by showing that it's not rationally related to any conceivable legitimate government interest, even if those asserted interests have nothing to do with reality or what really happened, right? We have to, it's not enough for us to show that the real reason for the law was illegitimate. We also have to negate everything that the government lawyers come up with, no matter how outlandish. And the good news is, well, I guess it depends how you look at it, but the, the, the situation is that government is so out of control that even under that ridiculous standard, we win more often than you'd think. Um, but really, and although I, I enjoy winning, that's actually kind of a sad indictment of how, how out of control government is. So within the context of those cases, then, the more cases you went under the rational basis test, are you going to support more or does it really come out as a lot? No, I mean, we've definitely made progress. And, and th those wins help in a couple ways, right? First of all, as I mentioned, every time we win one of those cases, it makes it easier to win the next one. I mean, we're up to a string side of like a couple dozen cases now where people have won economic liberty rational basis challenges in court. And so the government lawyers, God bless them, they still try to argue that you can't win. And then we show, you know, over 20 cases where you've won and that gets the judge's attention. Doesn't mean we win and we don't dispute that under the precedent, it's a deferential test but there is some real judging involved. And because these laws are so outlandish, once you have some actually engaged judging, even at any level, we've got a good shot. Um, and then on top of that, you know, at least some legislators are going to notice this. We, we tend to get media attention. Uh, many legislators are lawyers. And so the, th the fear of being sued will sometimes also have an impact. And not just with constitutional cha challenges. Obviously, that's what I've been talking about today because I'm a constitutional lawyer. Many of you also probably know that the U.S. Supreme Court a few years ago ruled that North Carolina's dental board violated antitrust law. And I know that also got many legislators' attention because of the potential liability. So anytime you have one of those cases where, where a court rules that the government has violated the Constitution, there will be some legislators who will notice that, maybe not as many as I would like, but you know, everyone helps. And, and you know, I, I don't mean to overgeneralize when I speak about legislators. Some legislators are working really hard to combat this problem. They should be applauded. Um, it's just, it's really, it's really tough to, to get that change through. It, it's much easier to block reform than enact it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. That would be wonderful. So I, I, I'm going to start off by not answering your question, but I will answer it. 
So I, I just want to point out the importance of your question. Uh, oftentimes, when I file a lawsuit or when my colleagues file a lawsuit, the big fight is over the, the level of scrutiny. And if we win on that argument, if we convince a judge that something other than the rational basis test applies, even intermediate scrutiny, which still puts the burden on the government, the government will throw in the towel. The government lawyers will be like, wait, 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 you mean the truth matters? You mean evidence matters? Well, we can't win. This law doesn't accomplish anything. We give up. We, we, and and, that, and like, more often than not, that's exactly what happens. They will only continue to defend the law if the judge agrees with them that the rational basis test applies. Once there's some sort of requirement that the government has to show that the law accomplishes anything beneficial, they give up because they can't do it. So that's a, that's a really important question that you just raised because that would change the whole ball game. I think we're still pretty far away from that happening. I mean, we have 80 years of bad precedent, you know, and um, it is bad precedent, um, but still, you know, for the law to be enforceable, it needs to be predictable. And when you have 80 years of bad precedent, that's not something you just get rid of overnight, particularly because of just the way that the Supreme Court works, right? They, the U.S. Supreme Court hates to reverse itself. It'll do it in, in some, you know, rare situations, but the, the U.S. Supreme Court would much prefer to gradually chip away at something or cabin a bad ruling over time as opposed to just reverse it overnight. Like it, it hates doing that. And so I think we really have to take that approach. It might take my whole career. It might, it might not happen until after uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm gone. But um, you really have to take the gradual approach. Um, I think um, the NAACP is actually kind of our, our inspiration for that one. You know, uh, I think oftentimes people think that um, in Brown versus Board, the, the, the Supreme Court reversed Plessy versus Ferguson just because like the culture changed or they, they woke up one day and decided it was wrong. That's not what happened. In that half a century between those two opinions, the NAACP brought over a dozen cases just chipping away at Plessy and chipping away at Plessy until in Brown it all came crumbling down. And I really think that's the model you have to follow. You have to just chip away at it and chip away at it and then maybe someday it'll all come crumbling down. We'll see. I hope so. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much.